to rising sea levels that increase the risk of catastrophic flooding, the impacts of climate change are global in scope and unprecedented in scale. Without drastic action today, adapting to these impacts in the future will be more difficult and costly. Welcome everyone to panel three, entitled Broadening Action in Sustainability and Climate Change. Thank you for accepting our invitation. We are glad and delighted to have you here. Uh, it's a very relevant panel aimed at discussing many of the challenges pertaining to climate change, which the first the world is facing at this very day um, and age. As a matter of fact, with us today, we have three experts in the field who will be providing us with further insight about the topic. We have Dr. Peter Heifley, uh, this time I corrected it, I pronounced it, pronounced it correctly. Uh, Policy Director at the Wilfred Martin Center, Dr. Jana Kokostova, Founder and Managing Director of the European Center for Energy and Geopolitical Anal Analysis, as well as Associate Analyst at the EUI SS. And last but certainly not least, Ms. Kira Taylor, <laughs> Energy and Environment Reporter at Euractiv. So before delving deeply into the questions which we have today from the audience and those online, let's start with a round of uh, introductions uh, from our speakers. Uh, we have roughly 10 minutes each, and I think it's best that we start with uh, Dr. Jana Kostova. Thank the you, Petra. Yours. Thank you for this uh, kind and very professional introduction and moderation. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. I'm very impressed by the Institute for Greater Europe. I checked your website uh, very briefly. I exchanged with Philip previously, and uh, it's a very impressive organization. So bravo to all of you for managing to, to create that. Um, and I think it's uh, very important that we are brought here together today to impact a very critical issue for the EU especially in the current environment. And I think it's this uh, Gordian knot of the climate, energy, sustainability, and geopolitics nexus. Um, and it's um, always a strategic issue. But in the current environment, it's absolutely essential for us to, to kind of manage to unpack it. So at the very start of the conversation, I think it's extremely important for us to recognize uh, that the EU dwells in unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented historic times. Um, we had the COVID pandemic, uh, the Ukraine invasion, acute inflation uh, crisis, and escalating cost of living crisis. We heard over the past week IMF and the World Bank projecting a debt servicing crisis globally, which is extremely concerning. Uh, disrupted supply chains for all types of commodities, um, and the persistent challenge of climate change, um, something that we don't speak so much about. But this year, in the past several months, we saw historic drought, aridity and storm records that just reveal that the climate emergency is there and it's accelerating. Uh, so that would produce dramatic structural reconfiguration of our energy security and impact by default the action on broadening sustainability, um, as is the, the title of the panel. The wider geopolitical impacts are striking as well. Commodities, markets and prices, as well as global energy alliances, uh, experience unprecedented gyrations, and we see this just by picking up the newspaper every morning. And this juxtaposes the traditional geopolitics of energy with the nascent geopolitics of decarbonization. And the period of volatility will be protracted. It will spill over well into 2023 with potential markets calming down with different variables needing to be put into consideration by 2024, even 2025, when we have some calming of the energy market as well. So this is the context in which we operate and within which we can discuss the challenges um, for broadening action on sustainability. Now, something that is very critical for me to, to underline at the very beginning is that the disruption uh, caused by the Ukraine invasion reveals chronic structural problems um, in the energy sector that would have caused uh, considerable problems for the EU energy and environmental policy with or without the invasion. And I think this is really essential for us to remember. We have, by purpose or negligence, um, ignored deficiencies and loopholes across the different dimensions of the so-called um, energy trilemma of sustainability, uh, security, and affordability on equity. Um, and the current context confronts us with these failures. Um, and makes us more cognizant, but also uh, a kind of in a frantic mood of um, reassessing the relationship between sustainability and energy security uh, policies and stress test our energy security and systems um, going forward. 
So the trajectory of the energy transition is critical here. Um, and policy measures for reconciling the current focus on energy security uh, with concerns for sustainability are important. Official pronouncements proclaim stoic support to the net zero economy, uh, notably with the Repower EU package. A lot has been achieved, ramped up uh, renewable energy commitments. Now there is some revaluation of the targets, I hear. Maybe you speak more about that. Um, upgraded hydrogen ambitions, a lot of uncertainty there as well. Uh, we can speak maybe in the Q&A. Um, and partnerships, uh, demand destruction measures have also been kind of undertaken or overtaken across the EU. The EU was also successful in attracting LNG uh, cargoes from global markets, filling in gas inventories um, and developing contingency plans to ramp up supply networks from the Caucasus to Africa. And there is a lot of uncertainty behind all of those achievements that I'll be happy to explore with you um, later on. Um, controversial consumer subsidizing and massive utility uh, bailouts have become a permanent feature of the market um, in recent months. Um, and they distort probably the most important achievement of the EU energy policy evolution over the past few decades, notably the um, liberalized internal energy market. And this is extremely, extremely concerning. Uh, the Endeavor has a hefty price tag requiring staggering investment and massive capital reallocation. So we need specificity today on the sustainability of current measures today and tomorrow because subsidizing the consumer is clearly not sustainable in the long term. It is not sustainable in the short term either as a blanket subsidization, I argue. We need really tailored and targeted measures, um, mainly through social policy rather than energy policy. Again, something to explore later on. The issue of equity within and amongst member states is also critical with current cacophony of measures clearly confronting welfare uh, with financially weaker member states that could impact cohesion and widen the energy poverty predicament um, along the familiar West-East axis. Very concerning. Um, squeezed budgets would also compromise EU ability to um, disburse climate finance globally. The EU is the, the global leader in terms of climate finance because sending money to third countries in the current conditions will be very difficult to justify to the electorate very concerning development as well. Simultaneously, while we invest in bolstering our domestic gas infrastructure and facilities, massive floating LNG uh, regasification terminals, uh, expanding capacity of infrastructure with third countries, we persist in affronting fossil fuel projects in third countries. And this is a bit schizophrenic and uh, uh, invites uh, a kind of the, this hypocrisy accusation by third countries I work a lot with African stakeholders um, and some of their accusations are quite justified. Um, so this can be really det detrimental to EU's uh, global sustainability action, but also leadership in bringing others together for sustainability on the global level. Also very concerning. Um, and amidst all of this, the global situation and uh, market dynamics are absolutely essential to inform our foresight and planning for hydrocarbons, but also for green commodities um, and, and metals. And sometimes it seems that we ignore the global market when we focus on the internal energy market dynamics within the EU, albeit they're absolutely critical because the EU is not in the global energy market. So just a few reflections on the different types of markets for different commodities. Um, global oil markets are extremely tight today spare refining capacity is virtually non-existent outside of china and russia that is and the attempted ostracization of, of russia um, can lead to oil market fragmentation based on origin absolutely unprecedented historically almost absolutely unprecedented an issue that merits vigilant attention the current capacity constraints are due to multiple factors but chronic underinvestment is a critical one, and that is a public policy failure, something to discuss later on. The current uncertainties to the global economic outlook and China's continuous lockdowns um, compound the investment environment. The seaborne oil import embargo um, for Russian oil would come into um, a place in December. We have the imminent end of the strategic, the US Strategic Petroleum Reserve release. The OPEC plus discipline, remarkable discipline, uh, we might argue, uh, would only tighten markets. The discussed price caps on Russian oil 
would compound the market rigidity um, and hit very difficult times for the global economy, by default for the European economy, and impact our action on sustainability, uh, climate change, but also market stabilization. Gas markets are in even more dire situation, as we can see uh, from the news. Um, prices in Europe reached levels equivalent to $400 per uh, barrel of oil, I think, in August. Absolutely cataclysmic development. And the price premium in European markets, um, together with tempered demand in China, managed to attract a huge amount of LNG cargoes to the EU, replacing lost Russian revenue. This is a huge success. Yet, the dark side of this is that many of those volumes have been cannibalized from financially weaker states, such as Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, that have been priced out, pivoted to coal markets, have been priced out of the coal markets as well, because the coal commodity price went up as well. Um, and this is a very concerning development um, and puts into perspective our global leadership in terms of uh, sustainability, but also empowering global development. Due to the marginal pricing model that by now everyone knows what it is, um, the soaring grass prices uh, have been translated to electricity price hikes, compounded by hydropower and nuclear um, power capacity reductions. Um, and in this context, we see a certain co-renaissance that despite pronouncement that it's going to be short-lived, it's still quite, quite concerning. Um, and this reveals structural problems. Clean energy generation has clearly been ramped up over the past decade. But without the essential stress testing of the system to intermittency challenges or to potential shocks related to extreme weather, cyber or hyper risks to generation, or any other type of geopolitical risk, the one the types that we see today. And this all would have created the crisis with or without the Ukraine um, conflict. I have been working on those issues in 2019, 2020, sending signals to the EU executive in terms of potential loopholes in the market that would destabilize our energy transition. In addition, today we need to hit dangers related to green commodities access constraints and soaring costs, where the risk of Europe um, replacing current with new chronic dependencies um, is not negligible. It can be avoided, but it's not negligible. Incentivizing innovation in emerging technologies such as hydrogen, CCUS, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. But also long duration battery storage um, are essential. Yet here, the big challenge is again supply chains, mainly for metals this time. Costs for solar and wind uh, power, wind turbine components experience unprecedented inflation over the past year. Uh, and demand is only going to uh, intensify. There is also going to be a massive scramble to access uh, the metals to build out electrification. We are moving massively towards electrifying everything. So steel, Key base metals, including copper, aluminium, and nickel, alongside the battery raw materials, um, would experience uh, global competition, soaring prices. Um, and all of these have been um, impacted also by the conflict because we should not forget that a lot of those metals are being produced in Russia as well. So the global situation and supply chains need to be carefully evaluated, um, and we need heightened diplomatic effort on this vector. So the talk about the orderly transition that we were hearing a few years back that caters to and bolsters the uh, uh, priorities of security, uh, sustainability, uh, and affordability seems very chimeric today, especially given um, acute market deficiencies. Um, and by default, this will impact any attempts to broaden um, action on sustainability. Um, so I will stop here. I'm very happy to explore potential solutions uh, in the discussion section and hear my co-panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for this insight. Uh, Dr. Peter. Yeah, well, Petra and Philip, thank you very much for this kind of invitations. Many thoughts you just touched, I will continue. And I take this title of broadening actions and also the conference Europe Beyond Orders uh, quite literally because I would like to change the perspective from outside Europe and what it then means for perceiving and shafting policies. I lived 10 years in the Asia Pacific region, so I followed the last 10 years rather from outside. And um, I think if we will really manage whether it will be an orderly transition or not, it will not be successful without engaging with main partners 
outside Europe, the Asia Pacific region is the still most dynamic region in terms of demography of business. Um, and the success there or the failure of a transition in this region will have way more impact on global transitions than maybe Europe's approaches. This is not to be said that we should not continue and strengthen our efforts, but we have to weight our weight in the writing and we will not be the major player in this field. It's the nations in Asia, for example, in China, India, Japan, and Southeast Asia, which really matters later on, maybe Africa, but for the moment, the dynamics is in the Asia Pacific region. I would like to split my comments in, in two parts. First of all, I look a bit on the European concept of sustainability because we are using this buzzword sustainability each and every day, hundreds of times, but have roughly an idea of what it's really meant. And I will see how it is perceived from abroad because if you talk to somebody and you're talking on different levels, I have a completely different perception of what you're talking about. This is not a good starting point and will hamper our efforts. And the second is I will make some very concrete recommendations, I think, Platforms like that are not only to discuss theoretical concepts, to really put things on the table, which policymakers or entrepreneurs, for example, should really follow up. So I will focus a bit on what I think are the next steps and points to be discussed. Well, you mentioned that um, the US traditionally considered itself as the leader in terms of transition, global environmental issues, and well, the stakes are quite high, both for 2030 and 2050. Well, we will go into the discussion later on whether this is still achievable or with this multi-crisis, polycrisis, uh, we have to configurate the issues as well. As I mentioned, even in Europe, the term of sustainability is quite vague, and the more it is in Asia, everybody understands something, but it has no coherent definition. And it is indeed, in particular in Asia, not about only emissions reduction, for example. This is very much the focus here in, in Europe. Uh, it is broad, and if you look into the Green Deal, for example, they have a very wide understanding of, but in, in normal people's perception, it's mainly still emissions reductions. And this is definitely not the case in Asia because they are following more this uh, comprehensive approach, what we have in the sustainable development goals, for example, which are 17 and emission reductions are only one. Asia, and this is quite understandable given the economic and social development there, is very much into integrating also social developments. You mentioned this developing issue. That's their main focus and emission reduction is one among many, but definitely is my experience not the most important one. So this has to be really taken into account if we want to push them to follow our path. And they don't have an integrated policy approach. At least Europe aims to have that one, but um, we can find some traces maybe in highly developed countries such as China, Japan, or Singapore. But if you look to the other countries, there is no coherent street strategy and that makes cooperation very difficult because we come with a full package to some extent and there's nothing in response to that. So we have to be very careful and I will make some recommendations later on how to overcome this issue. Europe and with the Green Deal wants to become or strengthen its role as a normative power. They want to set standards, rules to be followed by others. Uh, but you pointed out the current crisis here in, in Europe really weakened this position as well because they look very much into the mistakes and the errors we made and they are carefully observing how we get out of this mess. And so they will not simply blindly follow the passes we have thought. It's the only way to the thing. Um, indeed, what has been shown in recent months and going back further, and this is something Europe and Asia both have carefully observed, is the vulnerability of our current energy system. This is something I think where both nations and both regions can really work together because Asian economies, for example, are as vulnerable. Even Chinese economy is extremely vulnerable. Uh, despite their advantages, maybe in some metals or some resources. It's not the, the bright story at all. They have very clearly defined weaknesses as well. So we have to see into this, if we talk about sensitivity, the vulnerability, the resilience building is a core issue, which we should have as one of the major points to be discussed. And 
isolating this transformation in terms of Green Deal um, to a narrow understanding of, of transition is also a, a great mistake. Um, the issue, for example, of trade and technology have often been mentioned and giving Europe as a major trade power, we have to focus more on, on debt instruments, for example. Trade is the biggest leverage I think Europe still has in this respect. We tried this in, you have followed maybe the discussion recent years on the free trade agreements where we had very ambitious goals. I think we went a bit too far and that type of agreements will probably not the gold standard for the future. We have to be less ambitious or at least have several steps in advance because others form trade unions in that sense and leave Europe out. That is a big challenge. So we're losing more than gaining if we set, I think, too high standards. Against this background, I have a couple of recommendations, as I just mentioned, which I think are very concrete issues and things to be considered for the future reform of our energy and sustainable policy. If you look into the variety of Asian with nations highly developed, such as Japan, but also very, very poor countries such as Southeast Asia, it's quite clear that there is no one catch-all approach. It's even impossible in Europe, as we have seen in recent months, and the less it is with nations in Asia. So we have to be very careful and we have to really design kind of tailor-made approaches which do not address the whole region, but specifically the needs of the respective partner countries. This is way more uh, effective and we have simply better understand what is politics and people driving in these countries. We, we still think that we have found the, the, the egg of the Columbus to some extent, that is unfortunately not the case. So a bit less ambitious, a bit more open to learn, to understand our counterparts is definitely needed. We are very proud in Europe sometimes of designing very complex uh, policy instruments, both domestically as well as abroad. But then if we look what's happening on the ground, and I lived, as I mentioned, 10 years in Asia, and I see how the EU is present on the ground or not present on the ground, unfortunately, to some extent, that is a big weakness. We can decide whatever, discuss whatever we want here in Brussels, but it's not transmitted to the ground. This is uh, part of the weakness of the structures we have set. That is a lack of cooperation with member states because such countries as Germany, for example, have huge investment by their own. So the combination of the European level and the nation state level is not functioning very well. They are rather sitting next to each other, but not really combining efforts. And also to decide what should be done on the European level, but what should be better done, for example, on the national level, because big countries such as Germany and France, or even smaller countries with specific approaches are way more effective and have this huge union behind. If we talk about designing foreign policies, it can't help to also streamline to a certain extent actions along with these overarching goals. For example, and I take again the example of Germany, we have defined this climate foreign policy. That means whatever actions we undertake, we have to put this perspective into. It should not necessarily dominate, but it has to be something to be considered in really shaping this design. The role of companies, for example, is absolutely important. It's not just state actors driving because giving the exchange in economic terms and Europe is still the, the largest trading partner. And if you combine all efforts with Asia, they are really crucial in transforming the respective uh, economies as well. But what we see often on the ground is that the market entry barriers are very high and we will not overcome uh, this without political backing. So Europe has to be really stand behind and backing up its enterprises. The technology is there, the finances are there, but they run into energy markets, which are often not markets. They are heavily protected uh, and state control. So Europe has to really put a lot of political pressure, in my opinion, to open markets, to make it a level playing field for European companies as well. Because if not, uh, progress neither here nor there will happen. Uh, it's not the state, it's the innovation the entrepreneurial spirit, which really changes things. The point of Europe being a normative power is something we are very proud of. It's perfectly right, but we have to not only pretend to be that, we have to really 
show it. And the best example in my experience is to have convincing examples here on the ground. So we have to do our homework here in, in Europe, then others will follow. Asians are very carefully looking how successfully we manage our transition here. And the more we are convincing, the easier it is to get them back on the trail as well. So I leave it for the moment. Thank you very much and happy to listen to the discussions. <laughs> Thank you for intervention. A lot of food for thought here. Uh, we'll move to Ms. Kira Taylor. And then we'll uh, start with the questions from the audience and those online. Thank you. Well, two amazing overviews, and I will probably focus more on the Brussels perspective. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm a journalist. I cover EU policy when it comes to energy and environment. Um, I tend to move with what's going on at the moment, and that means that at the moment I'm extremely focused on the energy crisis. Uh, but of course, we also have the ongoing negotiations on what was called Fit for 55, the EU's big climate package. Um, because those are now in trilogues, these discussions between EU counts, uh, the EU countries, the European Parliament and the Commission, they're a bit more behind the scenes now. We're hearing some things from it and uh, there will be a meeting of environment ministers and then a meeting of energy ministers later this month. And there we will hopefully see what progress has been made. But really, when you look at what the EU capitals and what the European Commission is focusing on at the moment, it is the energy crisis. Um, I've been following it since uh, it started a year ago, but you can really feel that uh, this summer and into this autumn, there has been an increased anxiety uh, in EU capitals when it comes to the impact on citizens, on businesses and the economy as a whole. Um, you're feeling that uh, between capitals, and you can also see it with the amount of emergency meetings that have been called. EU countries really looking for a way of working on this together, but we will see how far they actually get uh, moving together. So, as I said, this has been happening for over a year, but we can see some clear points where it has worsened. So it began with uh, several factors, mostly Gazprom not properly filling it, its gas storage in the EU, we then moved into the war in Ukraine and gas cutoffs that lasted throughout the summer of 2022. We had low electricity production over the summer because of droughts uh, preventing hydropower production, some nuclear power plants being in maintenance, and those further worsened the energy crisis. And now as we look into this winter, it really depends on several factors. It depends on how cold this winter is, uh, how EU countries managed to refill their storages after this winter and how far the EU can save gas but also save energy in general. Um, in some ways the energy crisis could help drive the energy transition and help Europe move forward with its climate ambition but that requires several things to come into place. So in some ways it has made people very, very aware of the fact that they use energy. People are seeing their bills, they are looking at their own consumption. Businesses are also very aware of this, maybe looking into what renewables they can take, whether there are any energy efficiency measures they can put into place. But if the EU is to truly drive this change, it needs to make sure that this winter is, uh, they are able to protect consumers. This change won't happen without it being a just transition and getting European citizens on board and not just European citizens, but people in the wider European community, particularly thinking of the Western Balkans. Um, similarly, certain measures need to be prioritised, and this is a real concern where we are watching the, the rhetoric and the discussion at the EU level at the moment. So support for renewables and energy efficiency will be key to get through this crisis, but not only that, to actually put in place measures that will drive the energy transition, tackle climate change, and lower the amount of energy poverty in the EU. Now, I think you referred to uh, the fact that we got a leak this week about the fact that EU countries could be looking at watering down the um, the ambition on renewables that was put forward in the Repower EU package, so it's packaged to get rid of Russian fossil fuels. We have seen that they, that EU countries may not be 
on board as much. I mean, this is a council amendment, so it's, we don't really know who's on board with it yet, but it could be the way in which the discussion is going, that they are slowing down this idea to speed up permits, which is one of the, the major issues, issues for renewables at the moment. Um, we also see that EU countries are hesitant when it comes to energy efficiency. Um, there are measures that could have been rolled out this summer when it comes to really simple things like loft insulation, um, which were just not really supported. What has been quite quick, though, has been movements on fossil fuels. Now, in some respects, you could probably argue that was needed because there was a very rapid decrease in the amount of gas coming from Russia that hit Europe's energy market. It hit how much gas Europe was able to use. So the EU and also EU countries went looking for alternatives. The concern there is that they are talking about maybe bringing in more long-term contracts. The question is, how long-term is long-term? How long is that going to last? And you have some people talking about the fact, oh, it's fine, it will be renewable, it will be hydrogen at some point. But what the narrative is at the moment is about fossil fuels. And there is this wider risk that the climate crisis gets pushed aside because of the energy crisis, because of the cost of living crisis. You mentioned as well, uh, climate finance. Um, there's a real issue that you know, with governments looking at their budgets, with governments looking at maybe the subsidies that they need to roll out, whether they actually are willing to put forward more money when it comes to supporting the wider world in, um, in decarbonizing and also adapting to the climate change, which we are already seeing affecting many, many parts of the world and Europe included in that. The next big question mark or the, the big discussion that is ongoing in Brussels and, and uh, EU capitals at the moment is what to do about high gas prices, how far to intervene into the EU energy market. Um, we see a big movement for gas price caps, uh, which could have a very immediate measure, but we are yet to really hear what the safeguards will be in terms of security of supply. Um, particularly with these types of price caps, maybe removing the incentive for people to use less gas, maybe even if you take the Iberian model, incentivizing gas use. And I think that is really what we are looking out for in the coming weeks to see whether the interventions in the energy market will actually be something that uh, tackles the energy crisis in a way that will really help it. And also, tackle the climate crisis at the same time. Um, so I will just finish on the point that this winter is going to be a huge test. It will test EU solidarity. It will test how uh, genuine EU capitals are about tackling the climate crisis. We will also see just how bad the energy crisis gets. And I think we will really see as we go through 2023, what the future trajectory of the EU will be when it comes to its energy transition and tackling climate change as a whole. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, we will now quickly move to questions from the audience and those online. Start with you and... Yeah, there's a question for myself, actually, not from the uh, online audience. Um, I think all three of you sort of um, combined uh, very accurately described the issues uh, on a policy level. And you can just sort of briefly mentioned, you know, the involvement of people. So I would like to maybe hear from the panel uh, reflecting a little bit more on that with stakeholder engagement, because terms like Green Deal, Fit for 55, Just Transition, these are things that go over most people's head. You know, how do you get people on board, you know, involving the, the relevant communities and, and stakeholders in, in uh, implementing the policies and, and transitions that you talk about. Uh, and yeah, from my side, so obviously the energy crisis is, I'd say, was a reality check for many governments' approaches to the energy transition at large and the lot of goals. And one of the examples is Germany with the energy vendor program. And there seems to be some regret in the public opinion about the, the approach to phasing out nuclear energy this fast. Uh, have we been, we as Europe in general, premature in turning away from nuclear uh, 
is what's the future of nuclear on the face of the current energy crisis? Before moving to, to your answers, anyone else? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question specifically for Director Heffern in light of your experience in the Asia Pacific. So you said that um, we should address some tailor-made approach for countries in Asia. So my question is about uh, ASEAN, the Association for Southeast Asian Nations. So before, uh, Madame Bahada said that uh, we have very few friends around. So shouldn't we consider ASEAN as a, a friend, as a possible interlocutor there? And I understand that I mean, ASEAN, it's, it's very different from the EU. It's made up of countries with completely different histories, cultures. So it, it may be a tough interlocutor. But if we have a tailor-made approach for countries in Asia, this doesn't this somehow hamper our relations with ASEAN as a group? Thank you very much. So well, let's stick to those for now. We'll with that, start with your answers. Shall I answer because some of these questions? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Sure. Well, to your question, uh, I think it's not a contradiction if we try to deal tailor made uh, to different countries because their needs and their importance are quite different. We have to address leading nations in this regional area. For example, it's Singapore, it's Vietnam, it's Indonesia. They really matter in this respect. And if we make progress in this respect, it can. Uh, might have a positive spillover to the neighboring countries. The problem of ASEAN, uh, and it's quite different from the EU, it's a state and a government-driven body. It lacks the, the interactions and the gluing together on the people's level. The biggest challenge in transformation in Asia is that they do not cooperate. There is hardly any transborder cooperation. They don't integrate policy. They even agree on, on certain topics. So this is a quite diverse area. So we are forced, frankly speaking, to deal with these different nations, despite the, the overarching goal to have a region to region cooperation, which in other fields might be correct. But if I look to concrete success, it will be bilateral to a large extent. Unfortunately, ASEAN is far and will never be a a union such as the European Union. This is not intended by the way by the leaders. Um, this goes a bit to your question. Um, what I have seen in Asia is very interesting on the local level. Um, take the example of urbanization. Asia is rapidly urbanizing a lot of, most of the problems we see in Asia and the transformation of this will be in Africa, the same in Latin America, is the way they, they develop into urban, urbanized societies they cannot proceed as they did it in the last 30 years. They follow very much the Chinese example or the US example. That's the European way of urbanization and, and they simply can't continue. They run into a wall in the nearby future in energy, in transportation, in infrastructure, even in health issues, which these are breeding grounds for pandemics, frankly speaking. So we have to find different ways. The biggest problem in Asia, and excuse me if I just focus on Asia, but it's some in, in other regions the same. These communities are constitutionally very weak. They have politically nothing to say. Much is decided on the central state level and then chosen a top-down approach. This is not very helpful to, to increase the acceptance. Nonetheless, uh, many societies are very active, particularly the younger generation. They want to find solutions on the ground. And this is my hope, frankly speaking, that there is a momentum which does not wait till the Hanoi or Jakarta tell them something they will never get this, by the way. They have to start on the ground and find solutions. In this respect, I'm quite optimistic. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics. It is hindered by the constitutions and the political systems, which are mostly non-democratic, big challenge, but nonetheless, they are not stopping. It's a young, it's young people there. The average age is 22 or 25 in, in ASEAN, for example. But there, is, there have to be answers found because it's their future, which is now at stake in this respect. And this is where Europe has a lot of experience because we are federal states. We have uh, strong communes, a lot of experience on the city levels ground. This is where I think the most effective cooperation should happen, not between the governments, but either enterprises or the, the urban level, for example. Should I, as a German, also answer to <laughs> the nuclear issue? Go ahead. Um, well, it's one of the advantages being not in Germany and we have a critical stand from outside. And of course, the whole sequencing 
of the energy transformation, in my opinion, was done wrong in Germany. We should have forced the exit from coal um, and then maintaining this base load uh, provided by nuclear power plants. Uh, I don't consider it as a, a very sustainable energy, I'm fully free, but we are still in need. And what I always complain to Germany is that they did not uh, kept um, the path open for technological innovations because there's a lot of things around and I'm not sure whether we will find different solutions which are more safe, can recycle nuclear waste, for example, which is the biggest issue for the moment. Uh, but saying this is gone, I think is against innovation and an openness to the future. There's no one path ahead. Germans, unfortunately, think very straightforward and they think they have found one solution for the moment, that's the given path. Please don't follow this through. Keep it open. It's an innovation process. We do not know where it ends. Um, yeah, so maybe a little uh, few replies on all the questions, uh, maybe not on the Asian one, um, but maybe starting with this one when you were speaking about Asia, I think um, there's some interesting parallels with the African Union. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it's uh, not as strong and solidified body as the European Union, but it's becoming stronger and stronger. We saw the EU African Union summit earlier in the year, um, and I think there is more and more interaction at this kind of African Union, European Union level interactions just to see how we can drive forward the transition across the African Union, but also in a way that, um, as I often argue, co-generating new initiatives rather than the EU, a kind of pursuing the normative uh, way of doing things, which is, which is not the right one to go and present uh, initiatives and solutions to countries that we don't know so well, we don't know the local dynamics so well, and it's something also that we need to tackle on our side because um, I work on a lot of ecosystems and uh, ecosystem degradation. You spoke about what sustainability is, how you can define sustainability. And of course, I think the defining uh, a feature of the decarbonization drive within the EU, but also globally, has been the, the, the focus on emissions reduction. For us, sustainability was uh, tempering emissions. But sustainability, so many other things, such as uh, uh, human rights, uh, elevating local communities, avoiding destruction of ecosystems, ecosystem meltdown, so on and so forth. So I think there is uh, a lot of work to be done on the European side to extend this notion of what is decarbonization? It's not only emissions reduction, it has to be related to ecosystems and so on and so forth. But, uh, but, but I think maybe what we are trying to do now with the African Union, really engaging both bilaterally, but also at the at AU level, uh, it's important whether it's going to bear fruit, we don't know in the in the short term, uh, just because uh, this um, a kind of accusations of climate colonialism, uh, green protectionism uh, are very strong and to a certain extent that can be justified. You spoke about trade, that it's a very important instrument, of course, but then the carbon border adjustment mechanism is something that is seen as green protectionism by Af African uh, partners. And it's something that we need to tackle because it is actually impacting their trade, uh, uh, trade balances as well. So it's important. Then there was a question about people, engagement of people. Absolutely. I think what the EU has been extremely successful earth is uh, to uh, to convene this uh, what every two weeks a new summit extraordinary energy summit like now we don't know when they're happening is that constantly um uh, so we convene in brussels the brussels audience so the people who are actually engaged on energy and climate related issues they know what's happening we become very attuned to to, to things that were very technical previously i'm a political scientist so for me the the marginal pricing model was something that was not understandable and now I can actually give lectures on this model because we speak about this all the time but then what we have not been so successful at the European level is actually bringing this down to the consumer bringing this down to to people in uh, Bulgaria Romania uh, Denmark if you want just for them to understand why it's important to uh, actually uptake these demand reduction measures this is something that we have been arguing uh, in interactions with the European authorities since last year, because the crisis, the energy crisis in Europe started already in September last year. Uh, a lot of different factors, you mentioned some of them, the global markets were disrupted already at the beginning of the year. That's, there was the the, freeze, the, the the Texas freezing weather that completely halted their energy system. Uh, there were disruptions. Uh, anyway, it's something that's maybe not uh, so related to the question, but, but uh, already last year we were issuing uh, recommendations that we have to go down to the member states, start massive campaigns through television, maybe uh, posters here and there, 
to make people engaged and own the issue of energy efficiency, reducing energy consumption, because it's something that is good for the environment, it's good for your bills, it's something that is going to help us pass a, a very difficult period going forward. This was ignored. These campaigns were not done when we were recommending them to, do, to, to be done already last September. And now we are frantically trying to do something. Like in France now, I think they would unveil this week or next week, uh, these massive campaigns on TV of us switching off lights. And, and this, this should have been done already last year. And then maybe our situation and energy uh, energy market disruption would have, been, uh, would have been lower. Going forward, it's this winter, it depends on weather, as you as you said. I was reading the FT the other day, um, and there was a, an interview with uh, somebody from the European. I can't remember. It's a very long organization, European Weather Service, something. I, I apologize. I can't remember the, the the exact organization, but it's a very authoritative agency of meteorologists saying that actually meteorology models indicate that the beginning of the winter would be very mild, but then would be followed with a very, very cold spell, which hits dangers for uh, January and February, what the EU is going to do. But also this is the immediate, the, the, the immediate period that we need to focus on, but we should not forget that 2023 will be catastrophic because this year, uh, Russia reduced massively supplies of energy, but still we had supply of Russian uh, Russian uh, gas to our system. Next year, potentially, this would be over. Next year, when China economic machine is coming back to the market, the the attraction of LNG cargoes to our uh, to our uh, markets would be not so optimal because then there would be a massive competition with the Chinese market, for example. And then we should not forget that LNG, uh, only 15% of the LNG market is a spot market price. Most of the LNG volumes are actually contracted volumes. Um, so next year, when a lot of the economies start uh, kind of recovering again, Europe, no matter how much we are ready to pay, maybe will not be able to access those markets. At the same time, in the US LNG industry, something I, I follow very closely, they're clearly saying, there was an interview uh, with uh, one of the biggest LNG executives there saying the US LNG is not going to bail out Europe. We should be conscious of that because there is a conversation now between the US administration and the EU executive on uh, securing a long-term LNG contract. But we should not forget that the LNG market is not a government market. In the US, it's a private stakeholders that are active on this market. So the US administration would not go and tell to LNG producers, give these contracts to the EU. And then the price cap idea would be very uh, interesting to follow how it's going to, to work because of this LNG, uh, free energy. And then going back to the... Um, uh, to Germany, uh, I will not comment on member state policy. This is not within my uh, my uh, contract prerogatives. But um, but uh, what is interesting in terms of the energy vendor, which was so applauded, is that it was a paradox. The energy vendor was a paradox. We had a massive ramp up of renewable uh, electricity, renewable energy within the system, and an increase of emissions. This is absolutely incredible. What what the energy vendor was. Um, then in terms of nuclear generally or across Europe, I'm technology agnostic in my recommendations in the way I approach the energy transition. I think what is important is really to think about the, the long-term security of our energy system and how to achieve this security in the most climate uh, optimal optimal manner. Uh, so there is a lot of discussions. Now nuclear gas are in the taxonomy. There is some uh, court cases against that. <laughs> anyway, let, let's see how this is going to, to, to progress. But I think what is important for Europe is to really focus on energy security and sustainability and be pragmatic and technology agnostic rather than uh, scapegoats of two types of generation because of uh, a very strong lobbies against the war and so on and so forth. Thank you very much and very briefly. Um, I think very briefly on nuclear, it is probably the most emotional um, energy source. People have either hate it or love it. Um, so it's very difficult to actually look through and actually see the science of it. What I would say is there is a movement, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe, where actually they are beginning to look at nuclear power as an idea. We see uh, other countries, we mentioned Germany, Austria and Luxembourg as well, very anti-nuclear, and uh, Austria raising its court case against the taxonomy. Um, on demand reduction, I would say we need to be very careful when we talk about demand reduction because the way that we can talk about these campaigns where you know, governments put something on TV saying we're going to turn off the lights can make uh, citizens feel very isolated and feel like they are the people who have to sort their bills. 
Whereas the whole idea of demand reduction is that it goes much wider to the whole economy, maybe where the shopping centres should have their lights on, maybe where the places should have their doors closed. And I think this narrative really needs to go beyond looking at what each individual can do and looking at measures that either local councils can take or national governments can take to bring together ideas that could actually create much more impactful um, interventions. I would then say as well, you were talking about stakeholder engagement. Um, it's a real patchwork across Europe, depending on it. I mean, one of the biggest issues with EU policy is how it's being rolled out. Uh, we see some issues with policy not properly being implemented, particularly when it comes to finance. We have issues with the money which is being you know, applauded at the EU level is ever actually making it to the people who it's aimed at. Um, you have some really good cases of energy communities, so people who have come together to have energy efficiency measures or renewable energy, but in many places those are still having issues with the fact that um, there's not proper implementation of recent EU policy. Um, again, you have some very leading cities, so you have um, places like Tallinn and Estonia. I was talking to their mayor recently and he was explaining to me um, how you know, they were looking at district heating, how all of the stuff they were doing to, to transform their city. Um, but obviously this isn't an EU-wide thing and it can often lead to rural communities being left behind. And those communities are often places where there is less access to particularly cheaper energy, there is more energy poverty. Um, so it's a real patchwork across Europe when it comes to stakeholder engagement and also between EU countries. You know, energy poverty has been a reality for countries like South, those in Southeastern Europe for a long time. Um, so they approach these things very differently. Okay. Uh, I apologize, I need to yes, leave because yes, I have my, course, um, course. my train back, but it was a pleasure. Um, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you very much. Thank you. For <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Hi. and uh, we have very little time for one final question, so anyone would like to ask one final question? No? Okay, it seems uh, everyone is uh, very hungry, <laughs> so uh, thank you very much for your interventions, very insightful, food for thoughts, I mean, um, it's a very relevant topic which is affecting us at this bit, at this day and age and, and many concerns going on but anyway i will stop with the blah blah and <laughs> move on the final part of this conference and uh, thank you very much for being here sorry it's not a lengthy lengthy close remark it is merely saying thank you everyone for attending the first great european conference it's been an absolute pleasure to see all the fantastic speakers, moderators, and of course the wonderful participants with all of your questions. Of course, it doesn't end here. We'll go over there. And the big part of this is being able to have young professionals and academics meet each other too um, and have some uh, cross ideas and cross borders in the meeting. Thank you again. This will definitely the first but not the last conference. I'm looking forward to seeing you at other events. Big thank you to the Cross School of Governance for hosting us and to the association for sponsoring us and everyone who made this possible. Thank you, have a wonderful afternoon.